All right, all right. Good morning, afternoon, evening, night. Depending on what time of the day you are going to be listening to this lecture, this is Financial Accounting 101, Chapter 7, Fraud, Internal Control, and Cash. We have four learning objectives. The first objective is to define fraud and the principles of internal control. The second objective is to apply internal control principles to cash. The third is to identify the control features of a bank account. And fourthly, we're going to be talking about explaining explaining the reporting of cash and the basic principles of cash management. We're also going to do one little one, which is an appendix, which is on the petty cash. So let's get into chapter one, uh, defining fraud and the principles of internal control. So what is fraud? Fraud is a dishonest act by the employee that results in the personal benefit to the employee at the cost of the employer. So examples of fraud reported as we have in the textbook um, include the following, like a bookkeeper in a small company that vouched uh, 750000 of bill payment to a personal bank account over a period of three years. Um, also in the text, we have a shipping clock with 28 years of service shipping. Uh, 125,000 of merchandise to himself, right? Um, a church treasurer borrowing $150,000 of church funds to finance a friend's business dealings. So why fraud? Okay, why, why does fraud occur? Many times, um, there are three main factors to, that contribute to fraudulent activities. Um, and it's, you can see that in the financial or fraud tri triangle, okay, as we have in the picture. So there we have what we call the opportunity. Um, for an employee to be able to commit fraud, the workplace environment must provide that opportunity, you know, for them to have been able to conveniently uh, commit that fraud. Another reason or another factor that contributes to fraud is the financial pressure. Um, employees sometimes commit fraud because of personal financial problems caused by too much debt um, or might commit fraud because they want to lead a very luxurious lifestyle. Another reason or factor in that triangle we can see is the rationalization. So in order to justify their fraud um, activities, um, they think that they deserve it, okay? So they feel like they deserve, you know, or they're not being paid fairly. And so stealing or committing fraud is a way to make up for that portion which they feel um, belongs to them. So employee feels justified in stealing because they believe that they deserve to be paid more. The Sabbath Oxley Act, all right? What can be done to prevent or detect fraud? After numerous corporate scandal came to light in the early 20s, okay, a part of it was the um, Aaron saga. Um, the Congress addressed this issue by passing what we call the Sabbath Oxley Act. All right, so under the Sabbath Oakley Act, all publicly traded U.S. corporations are required to maintain an adequate system of internal control. Okay, also the corporate executive and board of directors must ensure that these controls are reliable and that they are effective. Okay, they have to make sure that these controls won can be dependable, right? And then also effective. Also, independent outside auditors must attest to the adequacy of the internal control system. So they need to get somebody from outside, which is an external auditor, uh, to audit them and make sure that these internal controls are in effect and they are also re reliable. All right, so the SOX corrected public company accounting oversight board, which is often called the PC, a O B. Okay. All right. So purpose of internal control. Why do we have internal control? First, internal control is the process um, designed to uh, provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of company's objective related to operations, reporting, and compliance, okay? In more details, the purpose of internal controls are, you know, to safeguard the assets, okay? You want to make sure that you are putting internal control system in place to make sure your assets, cash, um, whatever assets you have are being safeguarded. 
to ensure accuracy and reliability of the accounting record to make sure that these accounting records are not manipulated these accounting records are true and accurate all right and to increase efficiency of operation and then lastly to ensure compliance with the laws and the regulation and remember that when we have the financial statement a lot of people depend on the financial statement to make decisions and once you pull up a financial statement you want to make sure that you are looking at the correct thing in order to make informed and correct decisions all right so internal control components we have five major components of internal control the first one is the control environment um it is the responsibility of top management to make it clear that the organization values integrity and that unethical activities will not be tolerated okay this component is often referred to as tone at the top all right so that's the first component of internal control number two we have the risk assessment companies must identify and analyze the various factors that create risk for the business and must determine how to manage this risk okay and then number three we have the control activities um, to reduce the occurrence of fraud management to, sorry, to reduce the occurrence of fraud, management must design policies and procedures to address the specific risk faced by the company. Okay, so they have to um, design policies and procedures to address specific risk that, that relates to their company. All right, so we have information and communication. The internal control system must capture and communicate all pertinent information, both down and up the organization as well as communicate information to appropriate external parties okay so that deals with the information and communication and then we'll talk about monitoring um, internal control system must be monitored right you don't just want to put a system in place and not monitor it you must be able to monitor it periodically for the adequacy see if they are working or they're not working significant deficiencies need to be reported to the top management and the board of directors so that they can improve on um, whatever um, they need to improve on all right so we're going to go into the principles of internal control activities um, each of the five components of internal control system is important here we'll focus on one component um, the controlled activities okay so the reason these activities are the backbones of the company's effort to address the risk it faces, such as fraud. All right, so the specific control activities used by a company will vary depending on the management assessment of the risk faced. Okay, when they look at what risks they are facing, that will now determine um, what kind of controls they're going to put in place. Okay, so there's no one size fit all. It depends on the organization and what risk they are facing. All right, this assessment is heavily influenced by the size, the nature of the company, like I said. So the six principles of um, the six principles of controlled activities are one is the establishment of responsibilities, segregation of duties, documentation procedures, physical control, independent internal verification and human resource controls uh, so we're going to start with the first one which is establishment of responsibility um, control is most effective um, is most effective when only one person is responsible for a particular given tax okay then establishing responsibility often requires limiting access to only one authorized personnel and then identifying those personnel so you don't want too many people going back and forth, you know, in one, um, maybe say the cash drawer, right? So that you are able to know, you know, who's responsible if cash is missing. Um, I remember when I worked in Kmart, um, when we start the day, everybody started with a, a, a balance, maybe of a hundred dollars. And um, we put it in the in your cash register. And that register is just from beginning of the time to the end. And when you're done with your shift, you take out your cash register, you go count it. And then at the end of the day or next day, the uh, person in charge of the cash or the cashier comes in to make sure that what you sold or the money you received 
through the cash register is the same with the physical money you know that is actually received so if anything if there's any discrepancy then they know it's my it's me right they're able to deal with me as a person as opposed to if five people were using that cash drawer then it becomes difficult to know at what point money got missing okay we also have segregation of duties different people should be responsible for related activities so responsibility for record keeping for an asset should be separate from the physical custody of the asset so whoever is keeping physical custody of the asset should not be the same person who is making the recording that's what we're trying to say okay so accounting like we have an example here accounting employee um a maintains the cash balance per book all right and then assistant cashier b maintains the custody of the cash in hand so it's not the same person handling the money that is also doing the record keeping okay um documentation process companies should use pre-numbered documents so that's why you have pre-numbered checks pre-numbered receipts right so you want to use pre-numbered documents and all documents should be accounted for right so if we are um if our receipts are pre-numbered according to one to ten you know we should not be missing eight if eight is missing then we need to find out why eight is missing now in the case whereby you have to avoid any of these uh, transactions that has to do with this document you don't throw it away right to just clean it out and then attach it right so each time we're able to account for each of these pre-numbered documents so employees should promptly forward source documents to accounting entries uh to the accounting department okay our uh, principles of internal control activities okay so we have the physical control which is the part of what we're talking about um so you want to have uh be ensure that the physical control is also safe so like where you keep your cash the cash vault right deposit boxes for cash and the business papers you want to be able to keep them in a safe place that not just everybody has access to them not just everybody has access to the money right or to the checkbook to print check at will right the time clock for record uh, recording time worked right you know people swipe in just to keep their um attendance you no know, recorded and nobody is like maybe if you have to write it out they, you came in at seven o'clock and you're putting um at six right so you want to lock the warehouses where you have your inventory uh computer facilities you want to be able to use like a card to be able to log in so that if any activity is being done it's done under somebody's name you know who deleted the file you know who added something right because the person has to use either a card to log in or a passcode to log in and as soon as you log in it's your name every activity that is done under your name is being recorded and being monitored um alarms for break in so like your cash rooms you want to have like an alarm system just in case somebody breaks into um the place where you keep your inventory or your cash or your cash office you know you have been allotted okay so televisions to monitor that's why in most stores where there's cash like the cash registers there are always there's always like you know cameras to watch and monitor you know where the cash is going like in the cash office so there's cameras right to be able to monitor just in case anything happens they can go back to the cameras and see if they need to see and verify who took what okay then the last the second to the last we have is the independent internal verification records periodically verified by an employee who is independent you know many establishments big you know they have what they call the internal auditors who help to you know verify um their records so we're here in the internal independent internal verification uh records periodically verified by an employee who is independent so somebody who is independent is coming to check the records make sure that the records are fine and that there are no discrepancies reported and no discrepancies and if there are discrepancies those discrepancies are reported to management so the human resource control right bonds employee who are handle cash so you want to put a bond on them just in case anything happens to the cash you know because they're abundant you're able to get that money back uh rotate employee duties and require vacation right um, i always give the example of somebody who i knew when i was doing my um what, what we call then the industrial attachment um and that person couldn't take vacation couldn't take vacation because 
um, if he did, you know, there was something underneath that was going to be discovered. Now I understand why. Then I did not, you know. Each time, like, you're so tired, you're tired. Um, won't you take it? No, oh, no, I can't, you know. And that was back where I lived, right, uh, growing up as a child. So when an employee is made to um, take vacation, you know, somebody else takes over the responsibility of their job, and this helps to reveal any discrepancies. Are they doing anything wrong, right? Rotating them so you don't want to put somebody in a position for over, you know, five, six years. You want that person to be rotated. When they rotate and somebody else takes it over, there's a possibility that you find out, you know, what they're doing wrong or what they've not been doing right or if they've been stealing. Also, we want to conduct background checks, okay, in order to know who you're bringing into the work. Um, do they have a criminal background and stuff like that? So that's the duty of the human resource, and those are all part of internal control activities. Data analysis, analytics, and internal control, right? Data analytics has dramatically changed many aspects of internal control practices. Okay, so in the past, internal and external auditors tend to rely heavily on investigation of period end samples of transactions to identify potential violations. Now, rather than wait for a period end sample, many companies em employ continuous monitoring of virtually every transaction. As a result, spike in um, certain types of activities um, or developing trends are more quickly identified and investigated. Okay? So, um, different aspects of journal entries can be monitored continuously, right? Through that, large dollar amounts in risky areas can be flagged and investigated quickly. Um, I remember where I work, right, if you, if you, if there are items that are both certain amounts, you know, it's going to be flagged, it's going to be red flagged, and they're going to be investigations, right? So, recipients of payments can be easily screened to ensure that payments only go to authorized individuals and vendors okay so there's a process that will be followed right a trackable process whereby anything that is done you know you sure that it's going to the right individuals and the right vendors and then sophisticated models can be used to continually estimate critical measures okay Limitations of internal control, uh, the cost should not exceed the benefits, okay? So when you are doing an internal control, you don't want to be, um, the cost of doing this internal control should not exceed, you know, what the benefits are going to be. Um, human elements, because of the human element, it's an important factor in every system of internal control. A good system can become ineffective as a result of employee fatigue, carelessness, indifference, um, occasionally, two or more individuals may work together to get around prescribed um, controls. Such collusion can significantly reduce the effectiveness of the system, right? Um, eliminating the protection offered by segregation of duties. No system of internal control is going to be perfect. And that's why we have to keep monitoring it time after time. All right. So another limitation is the size of the business also may impose the limitation on internal control. Small companies often find it difficult to segregate duties or provide for independent um, internal verification. Um, a study of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners indicate that businesses with uh, fewer than 100 employees are most at risk for employees for employee theft. All right. So the smaller it is, the more difficult it is to be able to put in effect um, internal control system. All right, these are controlled activities. This is an example we need to we can work on. Um, identify each control activity is sorry, control activities. Identify which control activity is violated in each of the following situations. The person with primary responsibility for reconciling the bank account and making all bank deposits is also the company's accountant, right? That's segregation of duties. Wellstone Company um, treasurer received an award for distinguished service because he has not taken a vacation for 30 years. Human resources, not good. In order to save money on other sleeves and to reduce time spent keeping track 
of order slips a local bar restaurant does not buy pre-numbered order slips that's documentation procedure okay all right learning objective two applying internal control principles to cash all right so we're trying to see how we can apply what we've learned in the last chapter and applying them to um to cash so cash is one of the assets that is readily convertible into other types of asset um it is also easily concealed and transported it's so easy to steal and it's highly desired okay because of this characteristics cash is the asset most susceptible to fraudulent activity so in addition because of the large volume of cash transaction uh, numerous errors may occur in executing and recording them to safeguard cash and to ensure the accuracy of the accounting records for cash effective internal control over cash is very very critical okay so we need to um safeguard our cash so the first thing we can do is to establish um responsibility only designated personnel are authorized to handle cash receipts that's it okay um we can document procedures use remittance advice cash register tapes or computer records and deposit slips right to be able to monitor the cash and segregation of duties different individual receive cash a different person records cash receipts and holds the cash okay so we want us to be able to segregate um duties so that it's not just one person that is doing everything um homework control you want to bond your like we said bond your personnel just in case anything happens you know you're able to get the money back you want to make sure they go on vacation right so that somebody else can have a third eye on it you also want to investigate do background checks um again where i work they usually do what they call um surprise visits or surprise checks by the internal auditors um any day they come to check the money you, everything has to be complete everything has to be in place um no borrowing of money no saying oh i, I borrowed it for a few now you know everything has to be complete right so independent internal verification so that goes under that supervisor counts cash receipt daily assistant treasurer compares total receipt to bank deposit making sure that what we say we deposit we made is deposited in the bank and then also physical control store cash in a safe uh limit cash limit access to storage areas use cash registers have like the alarm system in place where you keep cash and stuff like that okay um cash receipt control see over the counter receipt so if you have like over the counter receipts segregation of recording from physical custody so whoever is recording should now also have physical custody of the cash an important internal control principle all right so we have a clerk here who enters sales counts the cash sends cash and counts uh sends cash and counts to cashier all right so you're sending the cash and the tape to the cashier then the cashier counts prepares the deposit slip right delivers cash and deposit it to the bank right somebody else's um records it the accounts department agrees with the tape to deposit in the bank supervisor removes the cash register tape sends the cash register tape to the accounts department accounts department agrees register tape to be deposits to deposit slip and records the journal entry okay so in this case you see it's not just one person that is handling everything we have different people that are handling um the the whole flow of the system okay all right so how again do we um handle mail receipts one should be opened by two people a listed a list prepared and each checked and dust for deposit only okay um each mail clerk signs the list to establish responsibility for the data okay then original copy of the list along with checks is sent to the cashier department the copy of the list is sent to the accounting department for recording clerk keeps a copy all right so again this is how we are going to handle the mail now just to ensure that checks that come in are not stolen or cash that comes in through the mail um is not being taken if it's one person that is being um 
open that is opening up the mail. Also, I'm gonna say rotating those people um will go a long way. Also, like whoever is gonna stand there to verify it could also be different because if these two people have worked together for so long and they begin to collide, then that makes that in this internal control system that is being suggested for cash uh, makes it really in all right so general cash deposit control generally internal control over cash deposit is more effective when cash pays by check or electronic transfer rather than by cash so we're suggesting that cash be paid or eft right application voucher system control um petty cash funds that's going to be in appendix 7a so cash disbursement document procedures use pre number check okay and account for them in sequence each car each check must have an approved invoice right um requires employee to use corporate credit cards for reimburse reimbursable expenses stamped invoices paid okay so when we use um pre-numbered you're able to track go back and see if any check is missing right oh we enter checks number one to ten but we're missing number eight again so we're able to go back to find out what happened you know to it um again segregation of duty different individual approve and make payments check signers do not record the disbursement at all okay establishing responsibility only designated personnel are authorized to sign checks and approve vendors okay so where where, where again where I work or where i used to work um we just have one person who is the check writer who does the check writing um she doesn't record and if you want to check um it has to have a backing of the vouchers that have been signed or invoices that have been signed and have been approved and then before checks can be written okay and wherever they keep the checks is kept in the vault safe and nobody is able to go there except authorized people okay so we said the physical control is kept the checks are kept in a safe place um, like we said before, there's also again independent verification and the human resources control. So the voucher system, a network of approvals by authorized individuals acting independently to ensure all disbursement by checks are proper. So the voucher system is a system whereby you know you have a network of approval. So it could start from um, your supervisor to the manager to the director, right? Going in that order making sure that this amount that we're about to pay um, is approved is recognized and it's good to go a voucher is an authorization form prepared for each expenditure in a voucher system okay all right control over cash receipts lr cortez is concerned about the control over cash receipts in his fast food restaurant big cheese the restaurant has two cash registers at no time do more than two employees take customer orders and enter sales work shift for employees range from four to eight hours uh contest asks your help in installing a good internal system of internal control over cash receipts so what do you think your suggestion would be before we go to the solutions try to think about it before you go further um a separate cash register drawer should be assigned to each employee at the time at the start of each work shift with registers totaling set at zero okay each employee should access should have access to only the assigned register drawer to enter all sales so they only have access to their own drawers and not to somebody else's each customer should be given a receipt okay that's also very important right because once you are able to print out a receipt that means the sale was actually entered if a customer does not get a receipt then it's possible that that money can be kept and not recorded as a sale in the system and that's why you see some place i think um i just remember which store does that if we don't get a receipt you know we're going to pay you more money so you always want to get a make sure that receipt is being given all right at the end of the shift the employee should do a cash count right a separate employee should compare cash count with register tape to be sure they all agree okay Cortez should install an automatic point of sale system that would enable the company to compare orders entered in the register to orders processed in the kitchen. Okay, these are all suggestions that Cortez can uh, can do in order to install um, internal control system in his business.
All right, so we're going into bank reconciliation, identifying the control features of a bank account. Okay, this is going to deal with um, bank reconciliation. So control features of a bank. Use of a bank contributes significantly to good internal control over cash. Right, so whereby a bank is used, oh my God, you are saving yourself a lot, right? By using a bank, it minimizes amount of currency on hand, right? Uh, creates a double record of bank transactions. Bank record creates an independent record of which to agree the company's book with the bank records, all right? So usually at the end of the, the month, you're comparing the cash balance, right? Your cash account balance with the balance with the bank. But because the bank is independent, right? It's a, it gives you a, an accurate record of you know what came in and your movement of your cash so uh, essentially the bank statement is a copy of the bank's records sent to the customer or made available online for review uh, like i always ask many of my students um, a good number of us have bank accounts and we do not check our bank statement to see if it reconciles with what we feel we we spent Okay, many times things get out of your bank account which you didn't even authorize. And so it's going to be a good practice for you to check, you know, your bank account, see what is going in and what is coming out. Okay. All right. So EFTs, disbursement system that use wires, telephone or computers to transfer cash from one location to another. All right. Use is quite common. All right. So normally results in better internal control since no cash or checks are handled by the company's employee all right so this is a very 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 good way um to minimize um fraud that relates to cash is through the use of ef all right so this is what a bank statement looks like each month the company receives from a from the bank a bank statement showing its bank transaction and the bank balance Many times, whatever you have as your bank balance may not uh, be the same with what you have as your can cash, as your own recorded cash balance. And that's why we have to do a bank reconciliation. Okay. Uh, showing the following. The bank statement shows the following. Checks paid and other debits that reduce the bank, that reduce the balance. Uh, debit card transactions. Electronic funds transfer for bills, payment, um, deposits, and other credits that increase the um, balance. We have direct deposit, we have automated teller machine, and we have electronic funds transfer. Okay, so we are looking at what increases it and what decreases our bank balances. Okay, showing the following. Um, debit memoranda, we have bank service charges, we have NSF checks, not sufficient funds, right? So these are checks that bounces. Um, these are going to be like a debit to your, to your bank account. And then credit memoranda, collection of notes receivable, interest earned, right? Um, these are things that come into your account as a credit. The account balance after each day's transaction. So for us, we reconcile the balance per book, that's balance by our book, by our cash book, and the balance per bank to so their true um, balance or correct balance. So reconciling items due to um, time lag, um, the differences could be due to depositing transits, it could be due to outstanding checks, uh, it could be due to bank memoranda. It could be due to um, errors. All right. So when we have um, deposits in transit, sometimes at the end of the of the month, uh, you receive checks as a business. You've recorded it in your account, but it has not yet made it to the bank. Okay. So the bank hasn't received it. So that means your own cash balance or your book will be more than what the bank has. Sometimes you have outstanding checks. These are checks that you have already issued to people. It has reduced your bank, um, it has reduced your cash book, but it has not yet been received in the bank because the customer you 
gave the checks or the vendor you give the check to has not yet presented those checks uh, in the bank. All right, so we have bank memoranda whereby the bank maybe takes out their charges and the rest of it. Then due to error, if either of you make error, you know, that means your bank accounts and the cash book is not going to balance. Okay, so this is what the bank reconciliation looks like. So we have the balance per bank statement and we have the balance per book. Adjustment to the bank balance. At the end of the reconciliation, the two balances have to be equal. Okay, it has to be the same. Again, we are trying to reconcile, making sure that our balance at the bank is the same thing with the balance in the book. Okay, so what are the things that we need to do to our balance per bank? And if we're able to follow this formula um, judiciously, we're going to arrive at um, our answers. So adjustments to the bank balance, we have deposits in transit. We're going to add that. So you look at the book, your the cash book, right? And we're looking at the cash book. You see that the, the, the cash book has recorded cash that is received, but it's not yet showing in the bank, right? So what do you do? Because it's already added to your cash book, you add it to the bank, okay? Then we have outstanding checks. These are checks that, again, you have written out, you know, but has not yet been presented to the bank. So because it's a reduction in your own book as cash book, it's also a reduction in the bank statement, right? In the bank balance. And then bank errors, depending, plus or minus, either we add or subtract, it's gonna give you the correct or the true balance. So on the balance per book, we have, um, adjustments to the book balance the eft collection and order um, deposit so these are efts that you receive that were deposited directly into the book into the bank but which is not yet reflecting in your bank your cash book okay we also have non um <clears throat> NS, nsf checks these are checks that um non-sufficient fund checks that bounced uh, maybe there are checks which you receive from your customers you put them in the bank and when the bank ran it through there was no sufficient funds uh, to cash it right so you have to come back and deduct it because at this point they now owe you money right they paid you the check with the mindset that they were paying you you included that in your cash received um your cash received and um got to the bank and then it didn't clear so bringing knowing that it didn't clear you want to deduct those checks and then um, make sure that your accounts receivable is debited uh, so that you can go further to get the money back from the uh, customers we also have the service charges that charges which the bank charges you which is not yet reflecting in your own account and that's why we minus it so it's deducted in the bank statement it's also going to be deducted in your books then plus or minus any errors which the company made and it should give you the uh, correct amount at the end of the day again the balance per bank statement after you reconcile should equal to the balance per book when you reconcile okay so we're going to do two, two examples and then we'll go from there all right so we have this example here the bank statement for lured company shows a balance per bank of fifteen thousand nine hundred and seven and forty five cents on april 30th 2022 on this day, the balance of cash per book is 11,709.44. Lab determines the following reconciling items. Okay, so there was deposits in transit on um, April 30th received by the bank on May 1. Okay, outstanding checks. Again, these are checks that you have um, written out to vendors, but they have not yet presented it in the bank. Um, so we have this number of checks. Other deposits run recorded electronic receipts from customers on account on April 9th, determined from the bank statement. Okay, and those are EFTs. <clears throat> then other payments, unrecorded charges determined from the bank statement are as follows: return check, and um, we have 420 debit and credit card fees, um, bank service. Uh, company error check number 443 was correctly written by Laird for 1226 and was correctly paid by the bank but in the books for Laird it was written as 1262 okay and the amount is 36 okay so we're supposed to do a bank reconciliation for this so let's do this together 
all right so we are preparing a bank reconciliation we have our balance per bank uh, you can find this question on page 722 of your textbook okay so we have our balance per bank statement to be 15,907.45 cents um <clears throat> one of the things we're gonna add to it is gonna be deposits in transit okay 2201.40 okay and then we're gonna deduct our outstanding checks our outstanding checks are checks number 453 457 460 add them all together it gives us a total of 5940 again you can find this question on page 722 of your textbook and that gives us a balance um okay we're holding on the balance so we're doing cash um cash balance per book we have a eft transfers that total to be 1035 points um 05 that's our cash balance at the beginning um <clears throat> errors is 36 when we deduct them together we get 36 um <clears throat> debit fees which is not yet included we deduct that that's 120 um nfs check that's non-sufficient fund checks which was returned we're deducting it um which is 425.60 that gives our uh, bank charges 30 um a balance cash per bank is 12,204.5 cents our adjusted balance per book also is 12,204.85 cents okay All right, so bank reconciliation illustrated entries resulting from bank reconciliation um collection of eft for payment of accounts by a uh, customer so we're trying to put this in the ledger and through the journal and then the ledger and see how it affects our cash book all right so 38 april 30th that's cash 1035 so we have that on so our electronic transfer which we got april 30th um and that will be accounts receivable 1035 so they owed before um which was um accounts receivable was all right so we're trying to see how these entries result from bank reconciliation um how to put them in our cash book and how it affects the cash book eventually okay so these are journals the first one we have here is collection of eft for payment for a payment of account by a customer so and the amount was 1035 this was paid through eft all right so that's an increase in our cash and a decrease in our assets which is accounts receivable of 1035 1035 all right the cash disbursement journal shows that check number 443 was a payment on account to andre company a supplier the correct entry is this okay so we have our cash um 36 and accounts payable 36 okay as indicated earlier an nsf check becomes an account receivable to the depositor okay because it was something that was paid used to pay for maybe a transaction they did with you but now that it comes back you know not able to clear then we have to make it an account receivable okay so accounts receivable four to five sixty and cash is four to five sixty okay we're taking it out of cash that's a decrease in our cash and we're increasing our accounts receivable okay so the next one is the bank charges fee for processing debit and credit transactions are normally debited to the bank charges all right so this is going to be <clears throat> a debit to our expenses which is increasing expenses and a credit to our cash okay which is 150 all right so this is how it affects our cash our beginning balance was um, 11,700, um, our adjustments, 1035, and, uh, for the error that we made and for the expenses and for, uh, the non-sufficient fund check. And that gives us a balance of 12,204.85 and that goes to the balance sheet. Okay all right do you want to try this on your own and then check out the answers as we go um sally kids owner of a linen kiss fabrics asked you to explain how she 
should treat the following reconciling items when recording the company's bank account um, a debit memoranda for an NSF check uh, to a credit memo for an electronic funds transfer from a customer and then three outstanding checks and a deposit in transit so Sally should treat the following reconciling items as follows deduction from balance per bank okay because these are things that already this the NSF is showing in the bank but not showing in the cash book okay so electronic funds transfer where do you find it you find it in the bank but not in the cash okay it's an addition in the bank account balance it's going to be an addition to the bank to the cash book okay how about outstanding check outstanding checks are found um in the in the cash book as a deduction is going to be a deduction in the bank in the bank balance okay how about deposits in transit deposits in transit um, increases our cash balance it's also going to increase our bank balance okay all right all right so the second to the last module or learning objectives we're going to be dealing with today um, explaining and reporting of cash and the basic principles of cash management uh, so cash consists of coins, um, currency, paper money, checks, money order, and money on hand or deposit. Okay. Uh, so any of this will constitute um, cash. Balance sheet reports amount of cash available at any given time. Listed first in the current access asset assets assets section. I'm sorry. Then the statement of cash flow shows sources and uses of the cash during the period, so actual cash, okay, um, which includes the currency, the check, the money order, and the money or the deposit, okay. Cash equivalents are short-term, highly liquid investments that are both readily convertible to known amounts of cash and so near their maturity that their money market value is relatively insensitive to changes in interest rate okay so they are cash equivalent okay they are very near their maturity date that they are not going to be sensitive to any interest rate or any interest increase um cash restricted cash cash that is not available for general use so many times most companies have what they call restricted cash that cash that they are not going to touch and they're keeping it for very specific purposes okay Reporting cash on balance sheets. We have current assets. We have cash and cash equivalents. 2,844. Short-term investment. 959. Restricted cash. 122. Okay. And that's how it shows on the balance sheets. Okay. So, reporting cash. This do it for A. Indicate which, whether each of the following statement is true or false. Cash and cash equivalent are comprised of coins. Currency, paper money, money order, NFC check, false because NFC check is not part of it. Um, we have restricted cash is classified as either a current asset, a non-current asset, depending on the circumstances. Okay, true or false? True. A company may have a negative balance in its bank account. In this case, it should offset this negative balance against cash and cash equivalent on the balance sheet. False. Because cash and cash equivalent often include short-term investment, accounts receivable should be reported as the first item on the balance sheet. False. Okay. Accounts receivable should not be the first. Cash is always the first item on the balance sheet. Okay. The operating cycle of a merchandise. <clears throat> Again, we buy our inventory. We have our cash. We buy inventory. Okay sell i'm sure we remember this in chapter five we sell the inventory accounts receivable mail check receive check and this is guy for a merchandising company okay uh so this is like the operating cycle when you sell your stuff um you buy your ad sorry you buy your um inventory you sell your items uh if you sold them on account then you have accounts receivable you send out your invoice you get the money either in the mail or through eft or however they pay it to you and then again you go out again to buy your inventory and that's the how the cycle goes all right so what is a good cash management 
increase the speed of receivable collection. So remember when we talked about in chapter 5, how people will give you discounts in order for you to pay back early. All right, that's uh, some of the ways you can encourage your receivables and get them back on time. Okay, you're giving a cash discount. If you pay early, I give you terms 2%. Um, if you don't, then the 30, you pay full amount. All right, so you try to keep your inventory low because the more inventory you have, uh, the more you're going to spend on keeping those items in the warehouse. Uh, monitor, monitor your payment of liabilities. Okay, so you have liabilities that you have to pay. You also, as a, as a merchandiser, you want to take advantage of sales discounts that are available to you. Okay, so idle cash, invest idle cash. So if you have like lots of idle cash, you want to invest them or reinvest them in business to generate more money. And then for, oh, sorry, I went backwards. But for you want to plan uh, timing of major expenditure. So if you're going to have like major expenditures, you want to plan them early. Um, you want to plan them ahead of time so that you're not spending too much at a particular point in time. So people even save up as to go. And then when you have saved them up, you're able to, you know, just expand. Uh, but whatever it is, you want to plan ahead of time any major expenditure that you want to carry out. So cash budgeting shows anticipated cash flows usually over a one to two year period. Um, cash receipts, um, that's the money that you receive. Cash disbursement is what you spend money on. And then we have financing activities. Um, enables company to plan ahead to cover possible cash shortfalls and to make investment of idle funds. Contributes to more effective cash management. Okay, that's cash budget. So we want to budget in order for you to be able to use your cash uh, more effective, eff effectively. You can understand the inflow and the ex and um, the inflow and the outflow of your cash. You also understand, you know, your receivables, how they are. You know, people who owe you money, how often they're able to pay you back, or those are not even paying you back at all. Okay, so this is an example of a cash budget. We have our beginning balance to be 38 for um, the first quarter. You're gonna do this again in um, in 102 for those of us who will be going on with um, accounting, managerial accounting. Uh, but for this class, I just want you to look at this table as we discuss it and then um, just try to understand. Uh, so beginning balance here is at the beginning of the first quarter is 38,000, okay? Now we have added receipts. How do we get this added receipt? We just like collection from customers, sales of security. All right, so we add them up together, and that gives us a total of 170 for receipts. When we add this 170,000 to our uh, 38,000, we have 208. So this is total available cash for the first quarter. And usually, you're only able to do the first quarter because the ending balance for the first quarter becomes the beginning balance for the next quarter. Okay, so we can only do one roll at a time. Okay, so inventory, disbursement, we bought inventories, we paid salaries, selling ex and administrative expenses, we purchased a truck, income tax expenses, expenses. Okay, so we add up all of that, it gives us a total disbursement of 182,500. We subtract our 182,500 from our total cash that is available, and that gives us a 25,500 um, more cash. Okay, uh, with that, do we have any borrowing? No. That's financing. Do we have to repay anything for now? No. All right. So our total ending is going to be the twenty-five thousand five hundred. Okay. So this begins. This is the beginning balance for uh, the next quarter. All right. So from the next quarter, from information based on what we see here, we have collection from customers, one hundred ninety-eight. With from what we have here, we don't have any sales of security. We add up um, our total receipts. We sort. Uh, we add it to our beginning balance, and that gives us um, two, two, three, five hundred. So this is the total cash that is available. Again, we have our inventory twenty-seven thousand two hundred salaries and wages seventy-two thousand. Um, and then we see we have um, selling and administration depreciation, purchase of truck ten thousand, income tax expenses three thousand. So our total disbursement is two one one. 500 okay um <clears throat> so 12,000 is what we have excess 
so they borrow three thousand sometimes people want to have a minimum balance in their cash if they don't have up to that they go ahead to borrow in order to make up for um whatever balance they want to have on hand okay so here we have fifteen thousand as a total ending cash balance again the cash balance for ending cash balance for one quarter becomes the beginning cash balance for another quarter so for quarter three we have fifteen thousand again collection from ca from customers two hundred and twenty eight thousand when we add that to the fifteen thousand we get four hundred two hundred and forty three thousand okay so we have inventory thirty one thousand two hundred sales eighty two thousand right and then we have depreciation and all that at the end of the day our total disbursement is 220,500 when we deduct that amount uh, from our total cash available we have excess available of 222,500 now they want to pay back what they borrowed and we are told that if you are repaying, you're going to pay $100 interest. So that's why we have 3100 Now we have an ending balance when we subtract of 19400 Again, your ending balance for one quarter becomes the beginning balance for another quarter. Okay, so the beginning balance for the fourth quarter is 19400 And then the flow goes like that all through till the end. All right, so Martin's company... Management wants to maintain a minimum monthly cash balance of 15 C. So they want to maintain a cash balance of 15,000 at the beginning of March The cash balance is 16,500 Except cash receipts for March at Expected cash receipts for March are 210,000 and cash disbursement are expected to be 220,000 how much cash if any must Martin Martini borrow to maintain the entire minimum balance so they always want to have a minimum ending balance of how much fifteen thousand all right so we have our beginning cash our we're going to add our receipts okay which is twenty one thousand we add that together total cash available is two hundred and twenty six thousand five hundred we're going to re 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 um, take away our disbursement for the month which is 220 which gives us excess over cash of six thousand five hundred because um they want to maintain a minimum balance of fifteen thousand. We are short of it by um, six five zero minus fifteen. We are short of it by eight thousand five. We're going to be borrowing the eight thousand five to meet up with an ending cash balance of fifteen thousand. Okay. All right. So the last of it is explain the operations of a petty cash fund. So petty cash funds are usually funds which a, uh, a company will hold just to meet up with you know um little cash like immediate expenses or things they don't want to go through the process of you know voucher process or approvals right usually somebody is in charge of the petty cash uh fund so it help, what you do is to establish funds um make payments from the funds replenish the funds okay and again, like I said, they are used to pay small amounts and in the funds, establishing the funds, making payments from the funds and replenishing the funds as they run dry. All right. So if lad company decides to establish a hundred dollar funds on March 1, the entry is going to be, what you think? A debit to credit cash and a credit to cash. Okay. All right, so making payments from petty cash, custodian has authority to make payments from the fund. So whoever is uh, holding the fund has the authority to make payments. Usually companies will specify, you know, what that petty cash can be used for and the rules and regulations that bind the petty cash. There's no one size fit all. Every uh, corporation, every business has their rules uh, with regards to uh, the petty cash, even with regards to amount. Some would say $100, some would say $1,000, some would say $2,000, because depending on the size of the company. All right, size of expenditure is limited by management. Size of expenditure is limited by management. Use of funds limited to certain types of transactions. Like I said, payments are documented on the pre-numbered receipts. Okay, signature of both the custodian and the individual receiving the payments are required on the receipts, and their supporting documents should be attached to the receipts. All right. 
Custodians keep receipts in a particular cash box until funds is replenished. Okay. Sum of receipts and money is funds should sum of receipts and money in funds should equal established totals at all time. Okay. All right, so let's see. On March 15, the petty cash custodian requests a check of $87,000. The funds contain 13000 cash and petty cash. Receipts for postage for the $4, fried out 38 and miscellaneous expenses of $5. The entry is March 15. We have a postage expense of 44 Okay. Um, what again do we have? Fried out $38. Um, miscellaneous expenses $5. Cash, total cash, which is a credit because it's a reduction in our cash. A reduction in cash, which is an asset, is a credit. Increase in expenses is a debit. Okay. Assuming that, assuming the preceding example that the customer only has $12 in funds plus the receipt as listed. The request in the reimbursement should therefore be for how much? 88. The entry is going to be as follows. Postage expense 44. Freight out 38. Miscellaneous expenses 5. Cash over and short $1. Cash 88 um, dollars. So we have a shortage of $1 because we're saying that um, with an assumption that the request for the re reimbursement would be for um, it's eight. Okay, that brings us to the end of chapter seven. Um, I don't know if we have any questions, concerns. Again, the office hours are there. The tutorial time is there. You can always take screenshots of your homework if you have questions or concerns, and send them to me and see how we are able to answer the questions together. All right. See you in chapter eight.